faithful, after his noble death in Vanity Fair, had been taken up in a chariot and arrived first at the Celestial City. But Christian was not left to travel on alone. He now had Hopeful as his new companion. And he would soon be in dire need of him. The road ahead was very rough and their feet were very tender with travelling and they became much discouraged. At this point, Christian espied a stile which led into a meadow and seemed to be a short cut. Here's better going, he said. Come, good hopeful, let's climb over it. He, what if it leads us out of our way? asked Hopeful. That's not likely, said Christian. Look, there's another man walking ahead of us. So over the stile they went, and Christian was well pleased that the path was easier on his feet. But in leaving the road, he had made a terrible mistake. For soon, night came on, and it grew very dark and they'd completely lost sight of the pilgrim ahead. Did they but know it, his name was Vain Confidence. Suddenly, they heard in the darkness a shriek, followed by an eerie silence. We'll go no further, said Hopeful in a whisper, clutching at Christian's arm. I would have spoken up before, only you're older than I am. But even as they tried to turn back, it started to rain and lighten and thunder in a very dreadful manner. Hey, where are we now? asked Hopeful, without hope. His companion didn't answer. He was completely lost, for the deluge had caused the waters to rise amain and wash away the path. They were even in great danger of being drowned, had they not found a narrow ledge with an overhanging rock. Here they sheltered as best they could and waited for the dawn. And being tired out, they fell asleep. <coughs> it was broad daylight when they were awakened by a grim and surly voice. What are you doing? It said. In my private grounds. Looking up, they saw before them the gloomy figure of giant despair, owner of Doubting Castle, out for his morning walk. We're just poor pilgrims who've lost our way, they said. You're trespassing, said the giant, trampling down my fields. I'll have to teach you a lesson. They had little to say. They knew they were in the wrong. And since he was stronger than they, they were forced to accompany him. In the light of day, they could now see before them the battlements of Doubting Castle. Here they were cast into a dungeon, dark and stinking. And here they lay from Wednesday morning till Saturday night, without one bite of bread or one drop of water. No one came to visit them. They were cut off from their friends. No one knew where they were. And Christian realised it was all his fault for taking the shortcut. And this caused him double sorrow. Now, Giant Despair had a wife. Her name was Diffidence. He never did anything without consulting her and she was even more malevolent than he was. 
So, when he was gone to bed, he told her about his prisoners and asked, What shall I do with them? You're too soft-hearted, she said. What you must do when you get up in the morning is to beat them without mercy. So, in the morning, he cut himself a grievous cudgel from a crabapple tree in his garden. Then, railing upon his prisoners as if they were dogs, though they had never uttered a word against him, he beat them most fearfully and left them helpless on the floor to spend another day in sighs and lamentations. Next night, the giant was again talking to his wife in bed. What? Are they still alive? She said. They've nothing left to live for. So, when you get up in the morning, you must tell them to make an end of themselves. Up he got, and went to them in a surly manner as before. Your only way out of this place, he said, is by death. So why are you waiting? Make an end of yourselves. He had thoughtfully provided them with a halter, a knife and a bottle of poison, so they could have a choice. When they respectfully declined, he looked upon them in a very ugly manner. He would doubtless have killed them himself, but that he fell into one of his fits. For the giant had a secret weakness. On dark and cloudy days, he was as strong as an ox, but in sunshiny weather, he fell into fits. They caused him to lose the use of his hand, and so for a time, he had to withdraw. Then Christian and Hopeful discussed among themselves what they should do. Perhaps the giant is right, said Christian. Perhaps death would be better than the miserable life we lead. Not everything, said Hopeful, is in the hands of giant despair. Who knows? But he may have another of his fits and forget to lock us in. Wait, let us not be our own murderers. In this way, Hopeful moderated the mind of his brother. And so they continued together another day in the dark. Then, night being come, and the giant and his wife being in bed, she asked him again about the prisoners. To which he replied, They are sturdy rogues. They choose to bear all hardships, rather than make away with themselves. Then here's what you must do, she said. Tomorrow morning, take them to the castle yard and show them the bones and skulls of those whom you already have dispatched. Up got the giant once again and took his prisoners into the castle yard as his wife had bidden him. These, he said, pointing to the skeletons, were pilgrims just like you who trespassed in my grounds. And when I thought fit, I tore them in pieces, as within ten days I will do to you. Back in their dungeon, Christian nearly swooned away, for now, through lack of food and by reason of his stripes, he could hardly breathe. But Hopeful again encouraged him. My brother, he said, 
Apollyon couldn't crush you, nor the valley of the shadow of death. And remember how you played the man in Vanity Fair. And don't forget, the old giant has wounded me as well as you. So let's bear up with patience and keep on praying. Then, as often happens in dreams, when things are desperate, Christian suddenly remembered. I have in my pocket, he said, an old key called Promise. It might just fit the lock. Why try it, said Hopeful. It was the middle of the night when Diffidence sat up in bed and roused her husband. Perhaps, she said, they have pick locks with them. That's why they live in hope. Sayest thou so, my dear, said the giant despair. I'll search them in the morning. That's time enough. <laughs> Even now, Christian was trying the dungeon door with his key. The lock went damnable hard. Weak as he was, he had to work at it. But at last the key began to turn. There was a creaking and a groaning. And the door swung open and in came the light of dawn. <laughs> What's that noise? said the giant, waking with a start. Better go and see, my dear, said his wife. Christian and Hopeful had run through the door only to be confronted by a new obstacle, a heavy iron gate. Wait, try the key again, said Hopeful. Christian tried it, and it worked. <laughs> then the giant was upon them. Nothing can save us now, cried Christian. All is lost. But no sooner had the giant come into the light of the sun than he had another of his fits. His limbs failed him. His legs gave way and Christian and Hopeful were quickly out of the castle grounds and out of the giant's jurisdiction. At the place where they had gone astray, they now put up a notice. Over this stile is the way to Doubting Castle. All trespassers will be destroyed. Take warning. That done, they continued in safety on the King's Highway. But not, I fear, for very long. Next time, we shall tell how our friends ignore some good advice and how the dark river lies between them and the celestial city. And we shall learn what fear possesses Christian because he cannot swim. <laughs>